and welcome to the Book Lounge. Today, we are talking about The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson. Your hosts, as always, are myself, Corinne Ritchie. And me, Tom butler Bowden. Um, and the general aim with the Book Insights and Book Lounge is to cover the books that can advance your work in life or in some way or just expand your mind. Um, and as Book Insights curator, I'll give my take on the book, why I selected it, uh, my highlights, and uh, why I think it's still relevant. Yep. And I will also weigh in on the book, give you some latest news about the author. And as always, the book insights are where you get the really in-depth explorations of the best nonfiction books here in the book lounge. Again, it's just an informal chat on the book of the week. Um, and now for this new season, we are excited to start bringing guests into the book lounge with us. Also, we have this new video component. So you can check us out on YouTube at Book Insights Pod so that you can hear us and see us. And today you get to also see our special guest. So um, our first guest that we're bringing on to the book lounge, he is the host of a book podcast called What You Will Learn. He has interviewed the likes of Simon Sinek, Seth Godin, Dan Pink, Jonah Berger, so many amazing authors. And he's a published author himself. He um, helps with business development. I am super excited to bring on Adam Ashton. Adam, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. They say you uh, always remember your first, so uh, I'm, I'm glad that I can be the guinea pig. Perfect, <laughs> perfect. I love it. That sounds great. Um, yeah, and Adam, so today we're talking about The Slight Edge, which has um, become a bit of a modern motivational classic, but um, tell us a bit about your background or expertise, like how you got into interested in this whole genre um and how how you came to do your podcast etc yeah so i i was uh a, i guess i was a bit of a nerd i i studied a lot in school i worked really hard to get as good as grades as possible and go to a good university to do a good course and then later get a good job but i i guess i was stuck in the in the textbooks uh and i was just stuck in following the course curriculum and just uh trying to work out what was going to be on the exam and learning that as best as possible but then ever so slightly, I got introduced to podcasts, I got introduced to books, I got introduced to seminars, and uh, and slowly, slowly started to break outside of the, the realm of just textbooks and started to look to other, I guess, real world education, uh, look at other areas of personal development, self-improvement, all that sort of stuff. And what that culminates into now is I, I've done a podcast with a mate for coming up to five years now where we read a book each week. And we talk about our best bits. So I guess our sort of uh, our slight edge approach is reading a book every single week. Every there's, I don't think there's a single day really of the last five years where I haven't read at least a couple of pages of a book. Um, so I'm always trying to improve myself. That's great. It sounds like you're a perfect fit because that's um, that's very similar to us. Constantly reading and talking about books every week. So that's that's awesome. Definitely a great fit for the book lounge. So can you tell us with all the books you've read and talked about on your podcast, um, can you give us like a, a life lesson, something that's been really impactful to your work and life? Any any bit of wisdom you can share with our viewers slash listeners? Yeah, one of my uh, one of my favorite books is The Dip by Seth Godin. And uh, he, he talks about that there's sort of three curves is like a, there's a, a cul-de-sac, which is basically just flat. It's just whatever you do, it's just flat forever. You're working hard, but it doesn't get a lot better. It doesn't get a lot worse. Uh, another curve is a cliff where you think it's getting better, but then all of a sudden one day it just drops off a cliff. Uh, and then there's the dip, which starts off going well like it goes up a little bit at first like perhaps you know you start a podcast you do your first episode you get your first listener uh someone writes you an email these are all like great wins at first but then there's a dip where it's just a long flat slug where nothing really happens uh you're working harder but you're not seeing any improvement really in terms of the external results and then right at the end you get the you get this little uh the rewards sort of exponentially come all at the end uh, so I think that's sort of like that trajectory of a project is something that I've really uh, embraced, I guess, you know, whether it's writing a book, which is a big, long, hard slog that, you know, you write your first page, that's awesome. You tell a mate and they give you a pat on the back and those rewards come up front. But then from about page two through to page, you know, through to the 99th percentile, then you're, you're really like, you're working really, really hard, but not seeing any rewards. And it's not till the very, very end when you finish the book 
that's when all the rewards come. So I think just knowing that knowing that, that that's out there means you're not going to quit right in the middle of it. And you know that, okay, the rewards are coming at the end. So I just got to make my way through to the end, not just give up halfway. Yeah, that's yeah. a great perspective that, you know, that there's something out there and it's not just what you can see right now. I like that. Yeah. Well, I think like if you're doing a podcast as well, like it's, uh, you can work and work and work and the downloads don't seem to be improving and, you know, nobody seems to be, it doesn't seem to be growing, but you know that once you get to, you know, the end, I guess, well, there's not really an end inside, but, you know, once you get to a hundred episodes, 150 episodes, 200 episodes, you're no longer that brand new podcaster that no one knows about. You start to build an audience. You've got a bit of reputation. You've got a bit of proof that, Hey, I'm actually going to be sticking around. And that's when things start to really happen. Well, that really sums up the slight edge. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's all about small things done, you know, on a daily basis that add up over time. Um, and I guess, I mean, my background is a sort of motivational literature and the whole thing of like, you go to a weekend seminar, walk over hot coals, um, a lot of sort of pumping fists in the air. And rah, you, get rah, really, you can do it yeah yeah you get a really big high and um but sort of like a week two weeks three weeks later it sort of wears off a bit um and for me this has always been my big problem with the motivational industry um that it that has this element of like entertainment almost about it um okay. but the follow-up of all the you know success takes place over time Mm. that's the basic nature of it um and um so unless you have sort of some program in place um to help you get over these bumps like you're mentioning to push you on um most people will give up um so it, i i think the slight edge i would put this book a very similar one is the compound effect by darren hardy um, I always group them together. They, they are almost exactly the same theme, approaching it in different ways. Um, but I just wonder, Adam, if you'd come across any other books sort of similar to the slide edge compound effect or any, any others that sort of carry a similar message for you. Yeah, the slight edge and the compound effect are definitely those, uh, definitely those two that uh, all, that they're almost the same book. I, I don't want to say they're the same book because they are very, very different. But uh, when you boil it down, they're very, very similar. And I think, um, I think I probably so I read the compound effect probably five or six years ago. It was one of the probably first ten books I I read, um, and absolutely loved it. And it's been up the top of you know my my top. 50 list for, for a long time. And then it was only about six months ago that I read the slide edge. Um, and I think if I had read the slide edge first, I would have preferred it. I think it's just a, the, you know, it was just that I, I'd read the compound effect first. I felt like I'd uh, sort of come across a lot of the material before, but they are two very, very similar books. And I probably push people more towards the slide edge if they haven't read either. Uh, I guess a, the other one from that, not, not totally similar, but is all the sort of the habits types of books. So I, uh, Atomic Habits, James Clear, that's a good one. I think yeah. Tiny Habits, um, BJ Fogg is a good one. And uh, even Mini Habits by Stephen Guys um, is, a, is a short and simple book. They're all, and, you know, Atomic Habits, Tiny Habits, Mini Habits, I don't know which one's the, the smallest, but they're all saying small habits are the way to go. Doing something simple, doing something small, doing something easy that you can do each and every single day definitely fits in with this slight edge theme as well. Has anybody written microscopic habits? Maybe that I'll write that one. <laughs> I'm gonna write it. One, yeah. Just, yeah, we need it. We need that. Like <laughs> yeah. habits that are so think... small you can't see them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a proven formula, obviously. You just need to find the different synonyms. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> yeah, so um it sounds like you've got a, a strong connection to the slight edge. I'd love to know any kind of personal application kind of stuff that you've seen. I know you talked a little bit about how it applies to the podcasting part of, you know, what you do. Is there any other way that you have seen the slight edge sort of impact you personally? Yeah, I think a, a big part of it is knowing that the the success, you know, the quote unquote, or the, the results come more from the the process from like a one-off event it's not like the the overnight success of course never is it's uh, it, they also you know t it took me 15 years to become an overnight success so you know that it's just a long and gradual process uh again just to use that 
I guess the, the book metaphor is the most visual one that just, you know, to write a book, you don't just sit down and write a book. It's a page every single day. And by the end of the year, you get to a book or uh, you, you, you don't just run a marathon overnight. It's because you trained every single day. Or if you, if you want to lose 30 kilos, you don't just drop it, wake up 30 kilos lighter. It's that every single day you chose to eat the handful of almonds instead of the chocolate bar or something like that. It's just the, the small process that uh, each and every single day you do something small. And then at the end, it works out. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not just thinking that success is going to be this one big thing where, uh, where Tom, as you said, you, you pump your chest, you walk over fire, which I also did at a, at a Tony Robbins seminar. Oh, oh my but, gosh. Uh, <laughs> I can't believe that. That's amazing. <laughs> but uh, so the, those, those are good. But as you say, it's more about the small, slow, gradual buildup that gets to the eventual success. Yeah. The, the, the point about the process is very interesting. Um, process over outcome, which usually phrased as, um, Cause I mean, just personally, like, cause I've written books before and when you, when you haven't um, written them yet, it seems like a huge mountain to climb. So the only way you can deal with it mentally is to break things up into day type compartments and just focus on the actual experience of writing the process of it, not even thinking about the outcome or you know, the, the chapter or, or where, where your deadline in six months time, you actually just have to enjoy the moment and get involved in the process. And then by doing that, you actually ironically lead to a good outcome. Um, and one of the best things from the slide edge I like is that he talks about the, the myth of the quantum leap and the big break. Mm -hmm. He just says so many people get, waylaid in their path to success because they are waiting for this big amount of money or this big job or this big success that they're waiting for um, and sort of failing to see that that's the sort of winning the lottery psychology um, that okay yeah occasionally does happen but 99% of the time the, the big break of the quantum leap thing just leads people down the wrong path absolutely yeah um, and then another thing that he talks about is, uh, is never waiting for inspiration and, and motivation. Um, just taking the, these small actions. And, um, so Adam just wondered how you sort of, when you are in a bit of a lull or, or you're hard to get a, you know, a, something going in terms of a project, what you do yourself to sort of get into your stride well i really liked the the story from the book uh where he talks about these uh these two young blokes that effectively grew up together uh one was uh dropped out of school went to work at the golf course mowing the lawns uh liked to go to the gym a lot and liked to build up his uh his big beach muscles but uh, other than that, he was a bit of a drop kick. In fact, he, he called he called this bloke the beach bum. Uh, he didn't really have a he didn't have a good job. He he wasn't really doing a whole lot with his life. He was just going to the beach and hanging out. Um, and then he talks about the other the other one, which was uh, uh, finished university, worked really hard, had a couple of jobs, worked his way up into management, eventually started his own company and became a millionaire. Um, so he, he talks about this millionaire and the beach bum. And as it turns out, they're, they're both him. So they're both, uh, they're both Jeff Olson. One was in his, in his, uh, in his youth where he was uh, going a little bit crazy. And one was when he sort of thought, okay, it's time to buckle down here. Uh, and I think it's just that idea that all of us inside of us have got either the millionaire or the beach bum uh, millionaire, obviously just being not, not so much about making a million dollars, but just having the, that the right attitude, the right attitude that you bring towards uh, everything you do. So I think just that decision filter is, is what I really like that every action you do, are you moving yourself more towards the beach bum or are you moving yourself more towards the millionaire? When you open the fridge, are you picking out the, the beach bum food or the millionaire food? Uh, you know, when you're, when you're thinking, what do I do next? You're sitting on the couch. Do you want to uh, play that next episode of the TV show, which is more the beach bum? Or do you want to turn the TV off and read a book, which is more the millionaire? So I think it's just that, uh, that decision uh, filter where I'm thinking, okay, what do I do next? Is this action moving me more towards the beach bum side or is this action moving me more towards the millionaire side? 
Yeah, definitely. I think that that whole concept of momentum, I think, is uh, it is really motivating in this in this book where it feels like every little decision is weighty. And I think that's sort of his main thing is you don't get to just sort of slough off these little day to day choices because those are what make the slight edge over time. Uh, because the more that you sort of think, well, this one action doesn't matter, this one hour, this one day, this one month, one year, the more that you just sort of think it's inconsequential, the more that um, that slight edge is gone, you know, as you just sort of write everything off as not important. So I think that's one of the things I like the best about the slight edge is he makes every little moment, every little decision, like you mentioned, Adam, they all feel like they're important. They add up to something, even if it's not the like microwave mentality of I spend a minute and then I instantly get my result. Um, you know, over time, you will see those results. So that's, that's definitely something I really appreciate about this book. <clears throat> It's like it's so slight that you that you don't even bother with it. Um, I think that's yeah one of the points he makes that um, it's very the, the line between success and failure is often very faint, <laughs> and you can fall either 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 side of it. Um, so is this book really? I don't know. For me, it's sort of like personal responsibility. That no one hands you anything on a plate and um, it's like reading a motivational book is just sort of the first start, the, fir the very first thing that you can do um, and the rest of it is just daily stuff. And one other thing I like the phrase that he uses is his day of disgust mm -hmm. when he was working out on the golf course and um, he's seeing all these sort of wealthy business people around the course and um, He's just a caddy and sort of going nowhere. And, you know, he, he has this feeling of disgust. He hasn't done anything with his life. And actually, um, you know, we always talk about like the carrots or what we're aiming for, et cetera. But getting away from something we don't want to be, the negative disgust is actually a very powerful driver. Um, I don't know if you guys have any experience of that, but I think you know, for, for half the population, maybe that's as big a motivator as moving towards something. Yeah, the motivation yeah. piece is definitely uh, an interesting one. Like, I loved what Jeff Olson was talking about, where he says, like, you know, why there were certain periods of his life when he was really successful versus why he was really, uh, like, failing. He's like, I'm the same person, so why is it sometimes you know, I'm able to accomplish big things and other times I'm not. I think that's an intriguing question and it does come down to motivation of like, what are you capable of, you know? And it definitely, to me, it reminds me of like when you have a newborn, you know, as before I had kids, I thought, oh, I need eight hours of sleep. And then all of a sudden you have a newborn. I'm like, I, I only had three hours and I'm totally <laughs> functional. I'm awake, I'm doing it. Like when you have to, you have no other choice. I think Jeff Olson says, when your back is against the wall, like you have no choice but to go forward. And so then it becomes this question of like, okay, well, how do you bottle that? How do you do that even when, you know, it doesn't, it, it you're not forced to, you know? Yeah, that's what he says. It's like the ups and downs of his career or whatever, that he'd be so desperate that he'd go on some crazy um, effort for like a few months to get where he wanted to be. And then when, once he achieved it, he sort of let go again and sort of fell down. Um, I don't know if that's what you're talking about earlier, Adam, to do with, with Seth Godin, but it sort of reminded me of it. Um, this whole idea that it shouldn't really be up and down. It's, if you have this daily routines and practices in place, it shouldn't be like that. It should be a sort of slow movement towards achieving what you want. Yeah, most certainly. And it's, um, well, that's a good, I think his, his brand new book, which has just come out in the last couple of months is called The Practice, which is all about having that, that daily routine, which is almost like the dip part two, almost uh, not obviously framed that way, but you could read it as though, okay, so the dip was that the overall idea and then the practice is almost how do you get through the dip? And I, I think it's just, uh, it ties into that idea of, okay, what do you, what do you pick? What can you actually make it through the dip? I think by knowing that the dip is there and knowing uh, the path that's ahead, you can you can quit before you start. 
in, in the sense that the dip is the worst time to quit. If you get halfway through and you feel like it's not going anywhere and you quit then, then you've wasted all that time. Whereas if you can look ahead to the start um, and, uh, and see, okay, well, this is what I'm going to have to go through to get to those rewards at the very end. You can think, okay, actually, I don't, I'm not willing to put myself through this. I need to pick a, a different project um, to commit to. Uh, maybe that when that was uh, Jeff Olson on the golf course and he was looking at those people, he saw that uh, he saw what he, he could have, he saw what he didn't want to have, and he chose to go towards that project. Maybe if he if the those um, whoever they were, those fancy bankers or those fancy lawyers were were being douchebags and uh, weren't nice people, maybe he thought actually I don't want to be like those people, and maybe he could he might have taken a different path altogether. But I think, but as you said, by, by seeing the, the end point, by knowing what you're going to have to go through uh, is a really good in helping what, what projects do you select? What things do you commit to doing? It's true. Yeah. And the happiness part of it, because he saw sort of a life that for him looked like a happy one. And so he knew that that's what he wanted to move towards. And that's one thing I really like about this book is that he does sort of weave in the joy and the happiness piece of it, because otherwise, what's the point? Like, yes, you can do all these habits and you can, you know, set up your life in a certain way. But at the end of it, if it doesn't make you happy, then there's no reason to do it, you know? And so that's sort of the first part of it is figure out what is that happy life? What is that golf course vision that you have of the life that you want? And then taking those little steps to, to get there and just making sure it's a sustainable kind of thing so that there is the daily like joys and the things that will keep you ticking, even if it's just thinking towards that happy future. Yeah, that's a, an interesting point he makes about happiness. It's almost like he says um, it's a shortcut to success because uh, we all know now studies that people who are happy tend to be more successful, have more friends, better relationships, et cetera. Um, so I, I quite liked that, that, that he threw this happiness angle in, that it wasn't just a typical motivational book, which is about career success or financial or whatever, that actually making a purposeful a, attempt to be happy or have as many happy emotions as you can on a daily basis should be as, as much a part of your routine and practices as, you know, saving money or working out or et cetera. Yeah, I've just been uh, reading um, Enchiridion, uh, Epictetus's uh, <clears throat> manual for living effectively. Yeah. And, uh, and really the, the, main, the main point is that what, what can you control and what can't you control? So if your goal is to become a, to make a million dollars, it's probably not really within your control. There's a lot of, uh, you know, elements of luck, a lot of external factors that you can't really control, but happiness is something that you can control. You can choose to do things that make you happy. You can choose to do things that give you meaning. And of course you can choose to do things that put you on the path towards making a million dollars. Uh, so what you can't control the outcome, you need to focus on the, the smaller things that are within your control. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that ties right into what Jeff Olson says about action, where, um, you know, you're always moving towards something, you're either moving towards what you want or away from it. And there is no stagnation. I think that's um, really motivating because it's so easy to just be like, well, I'll deal with it tomorrow. And then it's like today doesn't count or <laughs> I'll deal with it next month. And then it's like this month doesn't count. It's like, no, every moment counts and you're always mm -hmm. moving in one direction or the other. Um, you know, he has this quotation where he says, the journey starts with a single step, not thinking about taking a step uh, because, it, you know, it's such a, it, it's such a like easy trap to fall into. It's like, well, I thought about this and I thought about that. And it's like, you almost feel like you get credit for just thinking about it, but it's like, no, if you get credit for every business you thought about starting, then it would be a whole different life, but you don't get that. You only get what you actually do. And so I think that's really um, a great point of just like, you know, there, there, there's no E for effort when it comes to just thinking about it. You got to actually take a step. Yeah. And he also talks about, um, I think he's got a good quote in there about um, success happens when you double your rate of mistakes, um, which is pretty good. I mean, you usually hear that about in relation to business and entrepreneurship. Um, but in, in terms of personal life, it makes sense too. I mean, in, in, 
Silicon Valley, it's the, the ethos is the A-B testing. So everything you do, you test two possible paths, it should go in uh, ways. And um, I quite like that as a, as a metaphor for personal life. Um, when, you, when you don't know what to do, just do a sort of small version of it um, and put it out there to your friends or whatever. And, you know, see often, sometimes they know you better than you know yourself. And, um, you know, they might say, that's crazy, you're, you're an idiot. Um, so I quite like the idea of purposely making um, tests or little mistakes, being willing to do it uh, in, a, in order to move forward. Yeah, I like that. And just to loop, loop it back to the dip one more time, it's almost like, well, you know, this, there's this huge project ahead of you, whether it is starting a business, whether it is your, your, your own personal you know, fitness journey, whether it is uh, starting a podcast, writing a book, there's going to be a big journey ahead of you. So if you, can, if you can do a small test at the start to work out, well, what's it actually going to be like? You've got an idea of how hard you think it might be, but by doing a small test, can give you that insight you need before committing to that big journey. That's right. That's a really good point too, because you're not just committing to the end. You're also committing to the journey. You're committing to every mm-hmm. step, you know, not just the end result. So um, that's something to think about too, is like, okay, if my life is going to look like this amount of work over this period of time, is that going to be a happy life for me? Not just the carrot at the end of it. Mm. Yeah, and um, I don't know if you've ever seen those things where, you know, people write at the end of their life saying what what do they wish they had done or et cetera. Um, but surprisingly to me when I've seen them, they never regret um, struggle, the struggle. So even if something didn't end in success or it was much harder than they, than they thought, they, in a strange way, now they're removed from it, you know, they, they think back with fondness about the struggle, whether it was like raising a family or creating a business. So I think that's worth remembering on a daily basis when mm-hmm. things seem difficult. Just think one day <laughs> I'll look back and think, <laughs> oh, that was great, you know, what I was trying to do. That's mm-hmm. true. Yeah, yeah. I think um, during this like quarantine time, um, something that has stuck with me that I think it kind of relates to the slight edge is this mantra I have of like, I can't do everything any day. Like there's just too many things that I could be doing on any given basis while stuck in my house with, you know, kids and husband and things. It's like, I want to do everything every day and I can't. So my mantra during quarantine has been, I can't do everything any day but I can do something every day. So as long as every day I'm doing something productive, something towards what I want my life to be like, something towards my house, my kids, my you know personal aspirations, then that's enough. And that just has to be enough right now. Um, and so, and I think of that like very similar to the slight edge. It's like, you can't expect the goals every day. You can't expect the result and the outcome constantly. Um, but even if you can't do everything, as long as you've got those small habits that you're, um, you know, continually on the long term, regularly doing, then that that's enough. And you don't have to worry necessarily about w- what's going to happen at the end just today. Just do what you know is correct for mm. today. And that's sufficient. Yeah, you don't have to do it all. But as long as you're moving in that right direction, yes. then yeah, you're on the right path. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, Corinne and I have been part of a team that's been building an app this year and mm. you know, many days, <laughs> you think, well, will we ever? But, you know, you just think to think, I've got five things on my, on my list today I have to get done or I want to get done. And, um, you know, that should be enough. Um, so, Adam, I mean, looking at the, at the book overall with Slight Edge, how, did, how does it fit into your canon of books you've read before and if you had to give it a rating what would you give it out of five yeah out of i was actually just looking back um because we did this on our podcast back uh well i think it was about march 2020 or somewhere around there and uh at the time i gave that an eight out of ten 
Um, and uh, I feel like my eight, my eight out of tens have been getting and, and above have been getting harder and harder to get. The more books I read, the, the, the higher that bar seems to get. Um, and as I said, I think if I read it, um, if I read it early in my reading journey, it could have been a 10 out of 10 as well, just because um, I think that idea, it's a, such a small and simple idea and the earlier you get onto it and the earlier you can put yourself on that, um, on that trajectory, on that curve of, of curving up, not curving down, uh, the better it'll be. So I guess out of five, I think it's a, it's a four, potentially even a four and a half out of five. Well, it's pretty good. Yeah. Cause I've seen some of the books that you've covered um, and there's some amazing ones on there, actually. Some quite a lot I've read, but many I haven't. So I want to check them out. Um, Corinne, how about you? I am also going to give this one a four stars. I, I enjoyed it. I think it's really helpful for work and life, which is what, you know, Book Insights is all about. Um, I would give it a five because I find it useful and great. The only reason I don't is because I am definitely one of those people that is not routine oriented. Um, routines are not my love language. Habits are not something I really thrive on. Um, I think I've told my husband, like, I couldn't do the same thing in the same order every day if you paid me. Like, it's just not the way my brain works. So that's my only reason for giving it four instead of five. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think I'll give it four as well. Um, I, I, what I like about it is it's, it's I mean, on, on the back of the book, the category that's in says motivation, but I, with the compound effect, I see as a sort of anti-motivational book because it's like it's, it's what happens in real life um, over the course of years and decades um, rather than, you know, what happens at a weekend seminar. So I love the fact that... Um, that Darren Hardy and, and Jeff Olson um, have communicated this idea to the world and, and keep sort of reminding us um, of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I love the book. I don't know much about Jeff Olson um, himself, other than that he's MLM, um, he's a real estate developer, he gives motivational talks. Um, Corinne, you know anything more? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So um, he's written a few other books, but it seems like compared to some of the other authors that we've covered, he doesn't have a ton of books. It seems like he's gotten more into um, business development. So now he's the CEO of an MLM called Nerium. Uh, they had to change names at some point because they were sued as many of these like multi-level marketing companies are, but I can see how Jeff Olson could be a um, the leader of something like that because he's so motivating and that's you know how these companies thrive is um getting people all excited about you know making a bunch of money and then four percent of them do and they get sued you know so that's kind of <laughs> yeah. the way that i'm pretty happens. sure um, i'm pretty sure darren hardy was pretty heavily involved in mlms in his early days as well so it must be something to do with you, if you write a book that talks about slow gradual daily improvements that you have a, a strong involvement in in mlm and that's well, right that's totally true. I mean, if you if you're in sales, you you you've got to really stick at things and have a lot of mental strength for all the no's you get. So you're right. I think there is a strong connection between the motivational literature. Going back to like Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, Dale Carnegie, um, a lot of the big fans of those early books were salespeople. Um, so. It sort of makes sense. Yeah, good point. And an I think learned that, optimism um, too mentioned something about salespeople as well, like just that mentality and how they can measure the, the how much more optimistic people sell than pessimistic people. Oh yeah, Martin Seligman's book. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think he called it explanatory style. Mm -hmm. How you explain setbacks to yourself mm -hmm. um, that you keep on going. So the uh, optimists have a different way of explaining things than, than pessimists. I mean, it's a pretty good skill. Even if you're overly optimistic, it's a pretty good skill to have as, you, as we go through life. Yeah, I think as a, as a bonus lesson, I think it was basically that if you, if you see setbacks as <clears throat> permanent and pervasive, uh, then you're in big trouble. If you say, oh, I'm, I'm no good, I'm never going to be good at this, I can never do this, everything about me sucks effectively, uh, then you're in, you're in trouble. But if they're, if they're temporary and specific in the sense that, oh, I was just off my game today or oh, I, I didn't prepare myself enough for this meeting, uh, then that, that's like a, a temporary thing that you can fix, that you can work on and, and come back stronger the next time. 
Absolutely. Yeah. The idea of like, oh, it just wasn't marketed well, or, oh, it's just this one problem and I'm going to fix that one problem and then it'll be fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's the slight edge. Um, I, I, when I think about this book, I think of it like a, like a graph, like it's, you start here, you slowly move it up, up a little bit, the going's tough, there's dips, etc. And then right at the end, there's like a, mm. you know, um, and it's, it's sort of takes a lot of faith to have this belief in the, this way of thinking about success, because maybe 70, 80% of the time, it's all in the, the lower part of the graph. Um, so I think we, you have to give yourself sort of short term landmarks, milestones, treats along the way to, uh, to keep you motivated. Um, cause the, the problem with like famous people, biographies and stuff, it's always like written how I did it, how I achieved it. So you're only looking at the final result. But for ninety percent of the population, it's all everything else that happens the rest of the time. So I, I salute um, Jeff Olson for for writing this book. Yeah, definitely. His equation of just like small daily habits that you know are in the right direction, plus long term thinking, unusual success. That's you know you put these together and you will have that unusual success. You will end up with that slight edge to success. If you can just do the right thing every day for the long term, then you can get there. So I think that's a really, uh, it's a great lesson and definitely makes the book worth uh, reading or listening to. So I think that's going to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Adam, for being on the show with us. Really appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. It was great to chat and and dive a little deeper into into all things uh, success, I guess, generally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if people are just um, wanting to follow up with you, they're just amazed at what they heard from you. Um, how do they follow up with you after today's episode? Yeah, whatyouwillearn.com uh, is where we, we put a, each week, we put up the book that we read, we put up a, a bunch of notes and we put up our, our own ratings out of 10 on it. Uh, you can find us from there on social media. Uh, you can find us on wherever you listen to this podcast as well. Uh, and one other thing that we do is our, our top 50 best books of all time is what we called it when we first did it about four years ago and we update that each year so it's it's uh it's it's due for an update soon um but yeah if you if you head to what you will learn.com you should see a big yellow bar down the bottom somewhere where you can get our top 50 best books of all time great that sounds good. Well, thank you so much again. And for our listeners and viewers, you can always um, connect with us, Book Insights Pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, or you can go to the website, memo.com slash, uh, slash insights.